here we are. We have made it to the crossing site of the Red Sea. It is so exciting for me to be here and to bring you here. And I wanted to show you exactly where we are on the map. This is one of the most important events. It happened just after the Passover. And so when the people finally brought their, their children and their animals and all their belongings out of Egypt, they started here, remember, in the Nile Delta, in Goshen. And from, they went to Sukkoth right here. They were very far north in this beautiful land in the top. And then the Old Testament tells us that they continued further toward Etham. Now you might see this, white, this blue line here. That's actually the modern Suez Canal. This was not there before, so they could have very easily crossed here into the Sinai Peninsula. It actually says in Exodus that the Lord didn't want them to follow the way of the Philistines, which would have been right here at the top, the quickest and easiest way to get back to their promised land. And so they continued on to Etham, but that's easy. You've got this other pathway through the wilderness of Shur. But it's interesting that they say in the Old Testament, Moses says, turn them back and I want you to go backwards. And that means instead of going into the wilderness toward the promised land, they go back to mainland Egypt, which is exactly where they're escaping from. He has them camping down here in a place called Migdal, or it says before Migdal, in this place right here on the sea, right here. So what do you have? You have Egypt in front of us, and then you have this barrier behind us. They don't know exactly why. Moses doesn't know why, but he has learned to trust in the Lord. But I wanted to show you what happens at the same time where the drama gets really intense. Down here on the Nile River is where the pharaohs lived. And at the same time that they are making their way down here, rather than across into the wilderness, being free, Pharaoh and his servants say, we've got to pursue them. What did we do by letting them go? So they come up here and they meet them right here. And this is where the Israelite people make those steps of trust as they begin their journey, their true journey of freedom into the desert. So let's read from the Old Testament itself so that we can get a full understanding of the reality of what happened right here. We've chosen this time of day to come here on the Red Sea, specifically because this is when they made their way here. It was evening. It was evening and they had just come down to this very shore uh, at that tower. At least most academics agree that it was in this area. You can read all about it in Exodus 12 and 13 and it's really worth going through it so that we can get the sense of what they were living, the sense of what the Lord himself was trying to teach them with his pedagogy. As it says in uh, chapter 12, verse 33, the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land. They were so tired of so much death and destruction that had been brought by these plagues on everyone except for the Israelites. They said, then just go. We know that they gave them the gold and the silver that they had asked for. And then it says, Israel journeyed, as I had said, from Ramses, where they were living, to Sukkoth. How many of them were traveling? 600,000 men on foot, it says here in the Old Testament. And so if we have 600,000 men, double that. You've got 1,200,000 people if you have one woman for every man. And if each of those, you just have one child, let's triple that. 1,800,000 people on foot. And there were most likely many more than that because there weren't just one child for every woman and, and man. And so most academics say, that there were over two million Israelites coming out of Ramses at this time. Two million traveling takes a very long time, but they were making it with all of their goods and they came to this place. And so it says, um, it was not, oh, and of course, I just wanted to point out, it says that they took that leavened bread with them. This was just after the Passover, it's completely linked to the salvation of the Israelite people from Egypt is linked to that time. No time to leaven bread. They had everything ready to go and they left quickly. Now I wanted to mention as they're making their way to Sukkoth and then down to Etham, the Lord himself is guiding them. He doesn't leave them alone. This is one of the most well-known parts of Exodus. It says here in chapter 13, 
They moved on from Sukkoth and captured Etham at the edge of the wilderness, the wilderness of Shur, which is right in front of us as the Sinai Peninsula begins. And it says, the Lord went before them by day as a pillar of cloud and led them along the way at night with a pillar of fire. So you can imagine how remarkable this would be, coming out of Goshen, making your way to Sukkoth and then down to Etham. The first night, even going down the Sukkoth, they had this fire that was guiding them in the desert. The next morning, it turned into a pillar of, um, of cloud. And so they were just moving forward, protected by the Lord. And I'm sure that would give them immense security. And so it led them along the way. And then it's, like I said on the map, the Lord said to Moses at the beginning of chapter 14, tell the sons of Israel to turn back and encamp uh, between Migdal and the sea. It's a tower, that's what that word means. Now, remember that Moses had been trained in the house of Pharaoh. He was a trained military man. You've got these two million people, and how do you organize them? Certainly you have leaders of camps and groups, and so they probably came out like soldiers did, defiantly, it says in the Old Testament. And they're, so, they're coming out by, by sort of hosts, by groups, and they're making their way to this very shore. Probably their leaders weren't too excited, nor were the people, because they wanted to continue forward and they didn't understand why they had to continue, because they knew very well that you couldn't cross this sea. And the only thing they had in front of them was that on the other side was Egypt. And that was their backs. They were backed up onto the sea. And this is what it actually says when uh, the Pharaoh was told about this, because of course he had people watching them. It says in verse five, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this that we have done, having let the Israelites go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 picked chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with, uh, with officers of all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh like he did with every single plague. And the king of Egypt, and he pursued the sons of Israel as they went forth defiantly. He said they must be lost in the wilderness. But there was Israel like an army defiantly moving forward. And so all of face Pharaoh's horses and chariots and charioteers was coming upon them. So you can imagine how exhausted you would be. You made it here, you're a little confused. And then this morning you look up, well, or maybe the afternoon, and you suddenly see coming from Egypt what you know very well, and that is the great army of Pharaoh. He is coming with the chariots and you know that you're dead. And so this is what Moses has to tell them. It's a beautiful way that the Lord is saying, you must trust in me. First of all, the people cry out against Moses. Were there not enough graves in Egypt that you should have taken us out here to die? And Moses said to the people, fear not. Fear not, ridiculous, but fear not, he says. And he says, stand firm and, this, and see the salvation of the Lord. These are words for our daily life, not just during this Lent, but whenever we find difficulties, we can listen to Moses who says, stand firm and fear not. See the salvation of the Lord. Why is he taking care of the Israelites? They're his chosen people. Why does he take care of you and why does he take care of me? We're his sons and daughters. He will do everything to save us. Everything is for that, even if it seems confusing, even if it seems we're going to be crushed and uh, trampled and trapped like the Israelites were here at the sea. And then he says a beautiful line. It says in verse um, 14, the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be still. Be still, be still. Moses learned that from the time, remember, when he tried to follow the you know, incipient call of God within him. And he says, oh, I will free the people. I will kill this Egyptian who's oppressing, oppressing the Hebrews. That's not the way to do it. Be still. Let the Lord, let the Lord save you. The Lord will fight for you. And in fact, I think probably the leaders of all of these different groups had that same message just transferred to all of the people. Watch the Lord fight. Watch him fight. And that's a huge deal when you think about the might of the armies of Egypt. And it's interesting how the Lord also rebukes Moses and continues 
to uh, push him into maturity. He says, Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. Right. Uh Uh-huh. Tell the sons of Israel to... Uh Uh-huh. But Moses does not flinch. Lift up your, uh, your rod, says the Lord. Stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. That the sons of Israel may go out onto dry land through the sea. Uh huh, right. That's worse than saying go forward. Okay, okay. The Lord will fight for us and I will do as you say. And that's exactly what Moses does. That's why I love being on this water with this staff. It is such a symbol of humility and such a symbol of faith. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, not just the Israelites, but the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord and that I have gotten, I have gotten glory over Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. You know, I often think if the Lord didn't want to also help convert Pharaoh's heart too, this heart that had been so hardened. You see something like this, I suppose you would convert as well. So Moses stretched out his hand, it says in verse 21, over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night. So you've got these millions of people approaching the seashore, millions crushing in upon each other, confused and upset. And there's this wind and the dry land appears. This is happening. It happens here. You'll be able to see it. We were absolutely just overwhelmed. And I want to show you some of these images. And I think it's the Lord actually giving us the grace to say, show the pilgrims and see for yourselves. This is what I can do. I will blow that wind all night and that dry land will appear. And then it happened all night long. And it says, And the sons of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being like a wall to them on their right and to their left. And this is one of the things I just want to point out again, the reality of this, of this event. Can you imagine something like a a wall of water? You know, you go to SeaWorld or you go to something like that, one of these places um, where you can see all the sea creatures. It's really overwhelming. But can you imagine a wall three, four, five times the height of this staff? That would be absolutely unforgettable. It would be frightening and it would be sort of like, okay, we have to keep moving forward. I'm gonna be crushed if I don't move forward. The Lord was just pushing them, pushing them, and they never forgot it. In fact, there's several Psalms, Psalm 66, Psalm 106, that speak about this event. The Jewish people go back to this constantly and not just during Passover. They go back to it time and again because this is their foundational event as the people of Israel. And so, of course, when the Egyptians see this, because of the heart that was so hardened in them, I'm sure the Pharaoh said, go and pursue them. So they go into the midst of the sea where the Lord is not outdone. And I'm sure the people in the back, I don't know which tribe was in the back, which group of people, but they were probably quite worried. But then this cloud that was leading them through the sea goes behind them. And it says here that the Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, and then it confused them. In the morning watch, this was about six, before 6 a.m., the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the host of the Egyptians and disconcerted them. And the host was clogging their chariot wheels in the bottom of the seashore, even though they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee before Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. You'd think they would have known this by now, but now that their own lives, the ones who are driving these chariots, these strong warriors, their lives are in danger, they said, this is true, we've got to get back. But they couldn't because the Lord said to Moses, and this is in the morning, stretch out your hand over the sea from that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its usual flow when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled into it as the water was coming through. And the Egyptians were drowned in the midst of the seas. This event is real. This event is foundational. Does it matter if they cross the Red Sea or not? Does it really matter if this was historical or not? Of course it's ma- it matters. It would be just like saying, does it matter if the Lord himself rose from the dead? 
if the Lord didn't rise from the dead, our faith is worthless, says St. Paul. It is just like, it's actually insanity. If this didn't happen, the Israelites would be no more. It wouldn't exist. It's like, you know, going back to this idea of the literature. If Sam, well, if the hobbits didn't go out and save Middle Earth, what would be of Middle Earth? Nothing, the world would have ended. The Lord has saved us through the Jewish people. This is why this event is so important, and that's why it's such a grace to be here, to see where these waters parted. This is the Exodus. This was the doorway out of Egypt and into this pilgrimage of freedom. So let's take up our staff and let's see what we can find in the morning. Let's see if we can find some of the bodies of these Egyptians who put their faith in the gods of Egypt and in their own strength dead on the seashore. Let us go forward, let us march forward with these hosts of Israel into the arms of the Lord who protects and cares for us and teaches us and guides us into true freedom. Thank you for joining us today here on the shores of the Red Sea. We have come so far and we are just beginning this entrance into a pedagogy of freedom. Know that we're praying for you from this place, from this incredible experience, and we hope to see you again tomorrow. God bless you.